Hey channel, Fernando from SkyFi Audio, in Glen Rock, New Jersey. Today, uh, I'm gonna go over a vintage Sony system that I've put together from pieces from our shop um, just the other day. Um, we did a video about a week ago of a similar system, but from Nakamichi. These are two great brands at, their, at the height of their, their market, essentially. Um, we're talking late 80s, early 90s, vintage, uh, sort of middle to hi-fi equipment. It certainly does not categorize as the, the top of the top. Those, that was reserved back then for Krell and Mark Levinson. But Sony and, and Nakamichi did a wonderful job uh, bringing consumer products. And if you sort of follow them over the 20, 30, 40 years of, of doing this sort of equipment, um, I've always felt that the uh, late 80s, early 90s was really their, their glory days. So I've got the privilege here at SkyFi Audio of, um, of going through the racks of equipment that we've got and assembling, you know, the greatest hits. And, um, and I've done that to some extent. Um, I'll link to the Nakamichi video that I did just below so you can watch it. Um, it was a bit more thorough in terms of equipment selection, um, but this is also a nice sort of uh, ensemble. Um, and particularly the amp and the preamp. These is, in fact, the best from back then. Uh, the cassette deck, I've, uh, I picked it because of its coolness factor. Uh, and then this tuner, um, actually, it could be considered the, the better tuner that they made back in the early 90s. The DAT, this lower DAT machine, is um, an average DAT machine, maybe not the best. But I'm notably missing a CD player. Um, and that was reserved, in my opinion, to the uh, 777 ESD, which is uh, a 50 pound Tour de, Fon Tour de Force uh, um, CD player, beautifully, beautifully built. Um, that from that point on, they just kept building subsequently less impressive versions. So uh, I don't have one. I had two earlier on this year. They both sold. There seems to be a good following for those working units. Um, but nevertheless, I think I've assembled a fairly, fairly good uh, system here. So in this video, I'm going to go over each model, talk about the specifications, the features, what we like and don't like. I'll then go around the back of the units and show you the, the connections, the inputs, the outputs, and, uh, and, um, and that's about it. And this is a good time if you, if you like these videos and we've earned your... Uh, uh, you're, you know, if we've earned your trust, we'd love it if you could subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. That'll keep us motivated uh, to keep doing these videos. Uh, a few more things. I've uh, got my camera steadied on um, a piece uh, on a table, essentially. I've, I've seen your complaints about my shaky hands, so I've got it stabilized uh, for now. I will move it around a bit. I've got it set to 4K so I can get you the best video quality possible. And I hooked up a speaker that you see right here on top uh, so we can show you some of the workings. So uh, let me dive right in. So here at the bottom is the N77, or let me start over, the TAN77ES. This is the king daddy of, of Sony amplifiers and probably the most desirable one. And pardon me for the glare. I've tried every angle I can think of. and. Uh, because of the glass meter still has quite a bit of glare. So the N77ES um, was the top of the line. There was a, a model just below it that did not have the, the meters. It was essentially the exact same box, but without meters. Um, and then, um, so this is a 200 watts per channel, 1986, 87, 88. End caps are made out of uh, sort of like a faux rosewood finish. Um, and um, an interesting fact about this amplifier is that they sold the design to AccuPhase, um, and AccuPhase sold it as the P4100, which is a 90 watt version of this amplifier, but the same, same design essentially. Um, like many receivers from this era, it does not go to a full rated power. 180, 185 is the most you can expect from this unit, but nevertheless, it's still a great performer, 88 eight ohms. There's only about half dB between the 180 and the 200 watts that it's rated for. So they don't go down the American conservative uh, rating system. They actually underrate. Uh, it has internal heat sinks, so you can see the there's nothing showing. Other than the woods and the front panel, there's no giant heat sinks or any way to dissipate heat. And um, obviously, it was, it was the best in the series. Um, a few things that are let down, uh, the speaker outputs are kind of junky or not as flexible as some of the current. I know that, for example, on the uh, 
Nakamichi equivalent. The, they had a five-way binding post or close to it. This is some sort of preparatory binding post that's mediocre. Um, and then the side panels, it is like a faux vinyl finish. So they do age over time. They peel, they rot, and there's a crappy uh, particle board behind it, which is a bit of a disappointment at this price length and this sort of the beauty of, the, of everything else on it. Um, so overall, fairly, fairly cool. And look at these meters. The meters, I mean, you can't fault them. They're absolutely glorious uh, meters. Uh, they're very responsive, um, and uh, it's bat lit red. Uh, interesting fact about the bulbs, one of the biggest blunders you can make in designing lighting for an amplifier is to put all the bulbs in series. Uh, and that's exactly what they did. Well, you lose one bulb, you lose them all. So, and also if there's a, a difference in, in, in quality of, or resistance in one bulb, it, they're all affected. So you end up with different brightness levels. But nevertheless, bulbs tend to last a pretty long time on these units. Um, zooming in a bit, we've got, from the left, we've got the power button and uh, speaker selector, which lets you go between A and B and also A and B, which is nice. That's right here. Um, the meters, uh, you can select to turn the meters on and off. Input can be either fixed or variable. It's right there. And then you've got attenuators for the left and right channel, which is a nice feature that eventually went away on most amplifiers. Um, moving on to the preamp. So the preamp is this guy right here, the EADES. Uh, they call it a stereo control amplifier. Um, it's a pretty interesting unit. It has uh, the first uh, notable feature is got a motorized uh, four gang Alps volume control. So super, super high quality, um, almost never needs cleaning. Actually, they're not serviceable, I don't think. And I've never seen one that makes noise. So great, great volume control. And then the input selection is a bit unique. Um, in the 80s, they were still sort of routing signals through the input selectors, which is a compromise. It's a very direct way of doing it, but it's a compromise in, 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 in design because you have to bring the signal from the back of the unit all the way to the selector switch and then send it all back to the output again. So you can pick up a lot of noise interference in the process. But uh, Sony uh, went a step further. They, this is actually just a selector, and there are a bunch of relays in the back. You can kind of hear them click after I change inputs. So you click inputs, and then a second or two later, you can actually hear the relay click. So that's a good indication that what you're doing in here is just telling the unit which input to switch to. You're not actually switching it. Um, inside, I've opened up a few of these units up over the years, and it's really nice quality. They have these giant copper bus bars for managing voltages. They have you know, two 10,000 microfarad capacitors, which is nice. Uh, so it's a pretty beefy power supply. Dual transformers, one for the audio stage, one for the control stage. And this neat source direct button. And that's, uh, that's a key feature of the Sony piece of equipment. If we press this Sony direct button, we can bypass a lot of the features that you normally wouldn't want in a high-end audio preamplifier. Uh, including um, the subsonic rumble mode, the tone controls, and a bunch of other things. So moving from left to right, power and uh, input selector here. You've got a tip output, which is, I'm sorry, the overall output, so you can actually mute the unit. I suspect that's so we can use the headphones. Uh, you can see it here. Yeah, so that's so we can use the headphones. Um, and then moving on, we've got bass and treble controls with the ability to select their attenuation. A record output selector, which is nice, uh, nice to have. It's got two tape loops in it. So this uh, controls the output stage for those tape loops. Uh, cartridge loading. It's got a very capable moving magnet and moving coil input on a preamplifier built into this unit. So we've got the facilities for moving magnet and moving coil with some loading there. A balance knob, a mode between stereo and mono, and uh, subsonic. This is to take the rumble out of a turntable, a low frequency rumble. And then a muting button that lets us attenuate uh, negative 10, 20 dBs here. So pretty cool piece, nicely built, and I'll show you in the back and a bit later why, why I like this preamplifier. Moving on to this tape deck, um, it's a TCWR97ES. And again, this is really just for its coolness factor. Um, I like this tape deck a lot, and um, 
it's a dual cassette, as you can see, which is pretty typical of, of this era. People were really back then into the ability to dub cassettes or make playlists out of uh, different cassettes. So this gave you those facilities and the ease of doing it. You could even dub high speed between the two of them. So if you put a cassette here and you put a blank over here and you wanted to make an exact copy, you could do it at a higher speed rate, which would save time. Another neat feature is the motorized doors. These doors are not mechanically activated. They're actually electronically activated. So when you push the eject, it's a motor with a belt that goes through the trouble of opening the door. Kind of a neat feature. A little unreliable, but neat nevertheless. Great display on it and tons and tons of buttons for all sorts of dubbing features and so on. So that's the cassette deck. Moving on to the tuner. Don't have a lot to report on the tuner. It's an S707ES. Pretty ordinary unit, but a good performer. Um, one of the things I do like about it, it does have facilities for two antenna inputs. So let's say you live in an area where um, let's say you live in an area where um, you have one radio station coming from the north, another station that's stationed to the south of you, and you wanted a, they're far enough where you wanted a directional antenna, this would allow you to kind of flip between antennas and select which of the two you wanted. Uh, tons of imp uh, presets, about 16 of them, or 18 of them. Uh, the ability to provide a calibration tone, uh, attenuation, band, mooding, all the stuff you'd expect from, from, from uh, a deck from this era or from a tuner. So um, it's got a nice display as well and it matches the entire series. So um, they made a bunch of models and I think this is towards the top of it uh, as you can tell by this uh, model number. And then lastly below it is uh, 75ES. The model is a DTC, uh, 75ES. It's a DAT tape deck. Um, they made a bunch of different models over the 90s. This was sort of middle of the range. It's got a really fast um, uh, VU meter, which is kind of neat. Um, because they use a fluorescent display, they can get some really nice speed out of it. And not much to report about it. Um, fairly unreliable. They almost all need some sort of service by the time they make it to today. Um, Typical will need alignment, belts, any moving part on it eventually goes. Uh, and this one is no, uh, no exception. Uh, this deck is currently not working. So it does open up, but I don't think it works. Um, and that's why I've got this other neat deck just above it. I thought I'd just pull this up and show it off. It's a TCD D10. It's a portable Sony uh, DAT. Uh, deck and uh, you can tell how well built it is is because it's still working I haven't touched a thing in this unit it came to us from a great client uh, as a gift and uh, we use it sometimes in the shop as a reference piece we move it around it's can run in batteries it's got a battery supply as well as a power supply and um, it's a really neat deck Let's see if I can show you some of the features on it yeah the the inner lid is motorized they're both inner and outer uh, sections. If I stop it here, I believe I can eject it. Oh, there's so many buttons on it. So here's the stop. There's the eject. Give you a sense of what a, a, a DAT tape looks like nowadays. In case you're unfamiliar with DATs, digital audio tape. So it's uh, it's a quarter inch tape. Uh, that has digital information on it. These were also used in the 90s for backup, for data backup for servers and computers of a sort. So pretty cool. Drop it in, close the door, and off you go. This is a portable machine, obviously. It would, came with a strap that you could hang it uh, as you walk around and record things. All right, let me look. Uh, show you the stuff on the back. Oh, let me, the speaker right here, this Sony X1, this is a really cool find as well. This is a very high quality, little mini monitor speaker from, from also uh, from the 80s. Um, came with the ability to be wall mounted or ceiling mounted. Um, and one of the notable things about it is that the woofer cone or the basket for the woofer is actually part of the faceplate. So it's actually been molded into it and then they put the basket on top of it. It's got a little ribbon tweeter in here and some controls to be able to to increase and decrease the uh, the tweeter level 
So Sony SX1 is the model number. All right, looking at the back of these units, pretty standard affair for the tuner, same for the cassette deck, sorry, the DAT tech. Um, same for the dual cassette unit, you know, inputs and outputs, MPX filter bypass here in the back. Um, moving on to the preamp, this is where things begin to shine. Um, we talked about the phono input. Uh, it's got a single phono input with a grounding wire next to it. Um, standard assortment of inputs and outputs, but here you go, balanced uh, set of uh, inputs for the CD player and the single set of balanced XLRs for the amplifier, which is pretty cool for a piece from this era that wasn't a, uh, a pro audio piece. So this is one of the first uh, Sony pieces to have balanced or XLR inputs and outputs. And oddly enough, if we look just below it, the matching amplifier does not. How silly is that? Um, we've got a fixed and a variable input on the amplifier, but no facilities for, for XLR, which is really disappointing. And these are those crappy um, binding posts I was telling you about that don't really work very much with anything other than maybe a braided, a stranded wire. I mean, in this case, I stuck a banana in there, but I know I'm gonna ruin it. So it's not a viable alternative. You can't get a spade in there. You can't get a, a banana in there. So it's really, you're left with uh, a bare wire connection. Oh, and you do have the ability to go between stereo and mono, which is neat. So if you had two of these, you could uh, double up on the power. All right, um, a bit about our music selection. I did find a DAT tape that had some Indian music on it. Seems that every time I choose a, a, a regular artist, I end up getting uh, blocked on YouTube. So I thought it was a safe bet to pick a live recording. I know it's probably not your taste and uh, this is not an example or, or an edition session. So I just wanted to get the, the, the needles moving for you on the amplifier. All right, so that's what I got for you today. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please uh, leave some comments below. I'm sure I made 10 to 15 mistakes, at least in the process of describing this equipment. I do my best in uh, at replying to all your messages and comments, so uh, feel free to leave me anything below. Again, check the link for the Nakamichi version of this video and our website, which is skyfiaudio.com, where you can see all this craziness. Almost every product that you see here is listed on our website. I think uh, we're right about five, 600 pieces at this point. Uh, and maybe a sneak peek of our new arrival. We just got a 2003 BMW 540i uh, with an M Technique package on it. And now we're gonna be working and restoring that over the next uh, couple of months. As you can see, we're into cars as much as hi-fi equipment. Tons and tons of inventory, huge speakers everywhere, a world of Macintosh, uh, you name it. So. Um, Oh, and this is the Nakamichi system I was telling you about uh, in the other video. So thanks for watching. Stay in touch.